Hello and welcome to my podcast, Conversations with David. I am your host, David Owasi. And on this podcast, we are talking to professionals and entrepreneurs across the country. We are learning about what keeps them passionate, what keeps them going. And we're also talking about lessons learned along the way. Now, I'm here with my friend, someone I have huge respect for, and someone I'm excited to chat with. His name is Aaron Anders. Why don't you introduce yourself, Aaron? Hey, David. Well, I, um, yeah, I'm yeah, i pumped to sit down and, and chat with you a little bit. And uh, for me, I, I mean, uh, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur, but at the same time, I feel like I wear a lot of different hats right now. So uh, husband, dad, which is a newer one for me. We've got a three-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, I'm the vice president of College Pro uh, at the moment. So I oversee that home servicing business, but a business that kind of has a dual focus in home servicing. We do about 20,000 customers a year, but also we have about 100 to 125 uh, young entrepreneurs that start their entrepreneurial entrepreneurial journey with us every year. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I love to fish. Fishing is a huge passion of mine and it led me to starting a fishing business. I think that's when you're an entrepreneur and you love something, you're starting to think about how can I I can make money at it. <laughs> How can I do Absolutely. it? So mm-hmm. I uh, I own and operate uh, a company called Wu Tungsten as well. So uh, a whole bunch of different things going on, but uh, I think it's been a great year uh, in 2020 to have a whole bunch of things going on. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about me. Excellent, Aaron, and I'm I'm excited to chat about some of uh, some uh, some of those pieces of things you mentioned. But I guess that the first point of question is, you know, you talked about you're an entrepreneur at heart. This is who you are. It's it's reflects in everything you do. What really got you interested in entrepreneurship in the first place? And I know your entrepreneurship journey started with college, for if I'm if I'm correct there. But what got you started? I I think my entrepreneurial journey started way, way before that. I, I mean, I think um, entrepreneurship right now in 2020 is pretty sexy. I think it's getting sexier and sexier in the world with everything that's going on. It's the ability to make your own luck, right? And I think to me, my the reason I say that, I, I believe that, you know, I was, it was built into me. It's part of my DNA is, you know, I'll, I'll never forget um, realizing that the the empty beer cans that were sitting in the corner of my, my parents' garage when I was like five years old were worth something. Hmm. You know, you start collecting them and then selling them to people for a nickel because I knew they could get a dime. So I, but if I could get it to them for a nickel, I got the nickel. I didn't, I wasn't able to bring them back for the dime. So that was something that was like me at five. Um, you know, when we moved, uh, I grew up in Barrie, Ontario. When we moved to, to, to that city, I was about seven, I guess I was about seven years old. And I remember like our house was the one of the last uh, streets that were being built in a subdivision. So the next subdivision was just being built. And I remember like in the summer, um, seeing a, a truck go through selling like pop and, you know, and, and snacks to construction workers. I'm like, what are they selling for how much? Like trying to figure that out. And then timing where that truck was going and thought it'd be the easiest thing for me to sell would be pop and so drinks to construction workers and filling a cooler because it blew my mind that, you know, I, I could buy pop, I could buy a case of pop at the time for like whatever it was, four or five bucks. I could sell 24 of them for 50 cents each, which was like 12 bucks. And then to triple my money, and it was still half as much as this other truck was selling it for. And so I do that three times a day all summer long. And it was kind of this like thing for me that, so for me, like it, it made sense. Like as I grew up, you know, in high school, I love to fish. Like I mentioned, I would fish, I would guide. I'm like, how do I spend more time on the water? Like, well, see if I get people to pay me to take them fishing, right? Like that's just what made sense to me. And then when I went to university, I mean, I took business in university, but I mean, the whole reason I chose business is because I wasn't really interested in anything else, right? And then when I went to school, I, I found out about College Pro, which was an opportunity to, it was actually a co-op job for me, but my friends were putting on a shirt and tie and heading into an office building in downtown Toronto, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with at all. Um, well, I guess there is now we're in COVID. <laughs> you can't really go to an office building downtown Toronto, but right, like the, the, the thinking of that, there's nothing wrong with it, but it just, that just wasn't for me, this idea of, being able to get my hands dirty and, and like I said, make my own luck and get out of it, what I put into it. And, um, you know, it just made sense, right. For me. So I took on running a franchise with college pro and continue to kind of work down that pathway. And so, um, so I do have a, a career right now 
And I also think I have one of the most entrepreneurial day jobs there could be. You know, right now we're, we're constantly evolving the business to try and help it grow. It's not showing up to work for me. It's trying to be able to show up and make something grow. So, you know, my entrepreneurial journey, I mean, it starts back as far as I can quite literally remember um, and kind of moves its way through now. And I'm still all day thinking about some of these things, right? I'm still thinking about like, what can we do differently? How do we make it bigger? How do we make it better? What else can I start? That's kind of cool. Can we, can we monetize this piece over here? So, um, you know, that's kind of where, where it went for me. And I think that's a big difference sometimes for people you can learn entrepreneurship right but you know someone i think of like a, i always compare it to sports if somebody is a professional you know playing in the nhl they're probably like on skates with a stick at, since the first time they could remember it's not like they picked it up at 23 and then all of a sudden we're able to go to the show that's not really like the the norm if you will you could pick it up at 23 and be gr- good and it'd be like part of your life, but it's probably like not part of like your DNA. And um, so for me, again, it's a blessing and a curse, I think. <laughs> but for me, for me, like I, I truly think building businesses and and being a, like a businessman, which is, I guess, kind of what entrepreneurship is, is. But, you know, that's that's kind of who I am. Absolutely. And that's a fantastic answer, giving me a, a little piece of, of your journey. And sounds like you've always been an entrepreneur at heart. And uh, that's fantastic. But one of the things you really pointed out that I think caught my attention was you talked about, you know, ent- entrepreneurship right now is sort of the new sexy. But I know when we were preparing for this chat, you and I referenced something about the, the reality about being an entrepreneur. It's not really sexy when you're really, you know, in the arena. Can you just po- uh, paint the picture for me of what the reality of an entrepreneur is. And the reason why I ask that is you know, some of our listeners or so, uh, people perhaps in second, third year of university, they're thinking, well, I think I'm born to be an entrepreneur. It's very sexy. I see all of these Instagram uh, bloggers, Instagram uh, people who you know have all of this cool life. And I think I want that sexy life. What would you say is the reality of being an entrepreneur? Well, I think like to me, you know, 25 years old on a yacht on a Wednesday afternoon, is like the equivalent of winning the lottery if, it, if someone did that through make, creating a business, right? Like I think there's um, a very big uh, elephant in the room, almost like poisonousness that is in the entrepreneurial landscape. And I think that that is okay. That's what happens when something gets super popular. But, you know, it'd also be really cool to be a rock star, but there's like, what? 0.1% of people that ever get there. And what you see is somebody on stage, but what you don't see is the hours, let's say writing or all the garbage songs that went in the garbage literally because they weren't good enough. All those different things that, that somebody has to do to get there. The investors that t- probably are backing the, the tour, the interviews constantly that somebody does that, that rock star doesn't want to do. They got to get up at whatever the flights that, you know, that concept, that joke you see where someone's like has to put on the back of their car- guitar, what city are they in right now? Like, that's not that cool. I mean, some people might think it's cool, but it's like, where am I? What am I doing? Like, it's just not what you see, right? Like you see the front of certain things and not the back. And I think that the back is a lot more of what being a true entrepreneur is. And that's not to say it's not great. I love it it's the ultimate freedom. It's the ability to make your own decisions, but it's really hard to be the one that makes every decision and be the one because there's no right answer. So if you, if you like school, like if you like being able to, to, to put something together and, and get marks and, and if you like school, there's probably a very good chance that entrepreneurship is not for you because they're, that's not a bad thing either. When I say that, but if you, if you're like, if you wanted to, so here's what I would think about it. If you wrote an, a, an exam and you, the mark you got back was a range, if they gave you like an, uh, a 78 to a 91, was it the range? And you thought that is the craziest way to get a mark, then you can't, you can't play in the entrepreneurial world. There's no definitive line for that. And that's okay. For me, 78 to 91, I'm like, sounds like it was pretty good. On to the next thing, 
right? Like that's kind of where it, where, where it is. And yes, you can stop and you can look and you can do a bunch of other things within that and figure out was it closer to 78, was it closer to 91, but there's no definitive answer. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of being an entrepreneur. And it's probably, something's gonna probably go through, I read something the other day where it's like the fourth or fifth business where somebody typically starts is where they end up and end up actually doing well with it. Because there's iterations of things along the way. And whatever you're doing in your fourth business, you learn pieces of from your first, second, and third business, and you finally put it together. But most people can't handle business one not being successful. And success for a lot of people is is a million dollars. Meanwhile, like if you think in the US, the top 1% of people start at just over 400 grand in revenue or in, in, uh, in income, not in like, you know, million dollar income, right? Like there's, there's less than, I think it's like less than 7% of businesses ever hit a million dollars top line, period, ever hit a million dollars top line. So I think there's a bit of like, in terms of somebody who's like in that point of their life, trying to define what is success, you know, there's a bit of that, you know, you mentioned the Instagram culture, like it's just, it's just not the way it is right? Like it's pretty cool to see somebody win an Olympic gold medal. That's very, very cool. But if it's an Olympic skier who won a gold medal, you don't see them in the gym at five in the morning. You know, you don't see them all the crashes and the scars under their, uh, you know, under their ski suit, <laughs> right? Of all the knee, of the knee surgery that they had, of the limping they're going to do when they're 53 years old because they, et cetera. So, you know, I think for me, I, I love it. It's the ultimate freedom. COVID has been incredibly challenging to navigate and you know for me i'm incredibly fortunate that my wife is working we've got two small kids i was continuing to work daycares were closed down i had the ability to move my schedule around but me moving my schedule around quite literally meant there was on thursdays and fridays when i was with our kids i'd get up at 4 30 so that i could work for two and a half to three hours before they would get up manage my kids, answer calls I had to through the day, but manage the kids, get them to bed, work for a few hours, go to bed, and then work Saturday, Sunday as well. And it was just, but I think that's, I think that's amazing. Like I, again, after, you know, let's call it week three, like I wasn't pumped about it, but I had the ability to go do that. A lot of other people didn't have that luxury. And that's kind of what I would think of. Like, that's what being an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is you got to get it done. You got to perform. There's no other way around it because you are the last line of defense. If you're not making decisions or doing something, something's not happening. So sometimes you need like that. You need to do whatever it takes to get things done or you will fail. And that's a pressure. A lot of people can't handle. I definitely agree with that. It is very easy to look at all the good. And I guess this applies with any famous person, really, or any successful person, right? You, you see the, the, the fame, you see the, the, the result of their hard work, and you think, oh, I'd like that. But you're not really thinking about all the hard work, all the sweat and tears uh, that has gone in the background. And I know one of the books I read by Robert Greene called The Laws of Power. It's actually a tactic of power. He's you know, showing people, not showing people the hard work you're doing in the behind, just showing them like all the good stuff and all the, you know, the cool stuff, but not really showing or sharing uh, all the experience that have gone in the background to, to uh, achieve whatever it is you've achieved. But one thing that I'm very curious, uh, Aaron, to ask you about is, you know, a lot of people, you mentioned that, you know, you, you were born entrepreneur, you kind of knew, like from us, young as you can remember that you entrepreneurship was something you were going to do but there are a lot of people out there who really have they don't have clarity on understanding what their passion is they don't have a clarity of saying this is what i want to do or this is where my passion is and you know they go through life they in university you know they're kind of just going through uh, their classes and they're still not sure should i do i want to be uh, in academics i want to you know change things up in the future how would you advise someone like that who is still unsure uh, about what they want to do and you mentioned that you know, you're not really successful on perhaps your fourth business or your third business. And uh, someone who is not really sure that they should be in entrepreneurship, if you know, they, they didn't get successful in that first or second business, they might feel like that's not for them. But how would you, uh, you know, advise someone who is going through that thought process? Or how, can they, how can they find their passion? Uh, I, first thing I'd say is don't worry about it. Like, what are you worried about? You're 20, if you're, you know, finishing university, you're in your 20, like, I think that your 20s are the weirdest decade of your life right like everyone's so worried about 30 i'm 35 so i when i think about that like 
my third, my, I'd way rather be 35 than 25, hmm. right? Like it's just 30 on has been great. So I mean, some of uh, a couple of things, don't worry about it in your twenties. They're incredibly challenging. So try a bunch of stuff. The only thing you can't do, don't put yourself into bankruptcy, <laughs> right? Like that's like, it. like, but so everything else, like don't hurt other people. Don't do anything illegal. Don't set yourself up into ridiculous amounts of debt and bankruptcy. And other than that, who cares? Just go do stuff, right? And don't be, there's a, there's a fine line between um, being a flake and just flaking on things and actually trying things. And it's okay to actually try things and decide what you want to do. And for me, like I would have, I could have, I could have never told you even five years ago what I, that I'd be doing now, what I'm doing now. Right. Like it, it's, I, there's like that whole ebb and flow. Like when I, so I'm 35, I graduated university, gosh, like uh, 12 years ago now, which is, mm. that's weird to hear myself say, but it's true, I guess. Right. I went to Wilfrid Laurier in Waterloo. When I was in university, picture this, I'm going into first year university. I'm in what's called the double cohort. So in Ontario, we had some people that had OAC, so grade 13, and a bunch that had grade 12. So that they, they actually got rid of grade 13. I was the last year of grade 13. So we had what called, was called a double cohort, double num- the number of people heading into university at the exact same time. So spots were tight and they actually overdid, over, the universities didn't uh, plan for the level of acceptance. They thought a lot more people would go back for another year. So they overbooked things like residents. And so universities had this um, deal to be able to give up your residence spot, go live off campus. And uh, I'll never forget one, you could take a thousand dollars cash. You could take a year of books from the bookstore for free, the university paid your books, or they'd give you a Blackberry. And I remember sitting in, in line, I was in line for registration and I was with my parents and I asked my dad, I'm like, what the heck's a Blackberry? And he was like, oh, it's like this smartphone. He's talking, I'm like, so is this smartphone? Like, how does this work, right? Like. So this is like 15 years ago and he was describing like how you get email to your phone and how like you can do that and whatever because he had a blackberry and i was like man like why would anybody ever want their email to their phone right i don't i didn't get it right and then by the time i was done university so as i was graduating university the number one employer in all of waterloo was rim so blackberry and we had rim park and like all these buildings were rim and all this other stuff like the iPhone didn't exist yet. Mm. Rim now, so flip it a decade later, like BlackBerry clearly exists, but doesn't really exist, hmm. right? When you think about Apple, clearly different direction. Google, Facebook. I remember getting a Facebook account in my my fourth year, so senior year, fourth year of university. That's when I got a Facebook account. So every let's call it like the some of the sexiest companies in the world right now today didn't even exist when i was that age so how can you want how can you know what you want to do and where you want to work because the your dream job your dream job like what your passion is a decade from now when you're 30 which means you're just getting into the in my experience best years of your entire life that company doesn't even exist today likely so what are you worried about I understand life pressures, things like that. I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. I'm graduating university. I'm an adult now. BS. Like it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like it's, so when I say that, like, it doesn't mean go be a flake. It doesn't mean go do nothing. Doesn't, but so as long as you, again, don't go bankrupt, don't do anything illegal. Don't hurt other people. Go try a bunch of things. That's how you're going to, you're going to find out what you really like. Like when I think about your twenties, they're weird. They're like in these two year chapters, you know, 19. It's awesome. You can legally go to the bar if you're in Canada or you're legally have a drink, like everything's new, right? Then you turn 21, right? And you're in this kind of bit of a different chapter. You can actually go out in the U S like you're like, you're almost like unlimited, untouchable at that point. And then you're 23 and now you're supposed to, you're graduating university. People are kind of asking you, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Right? Like you're whatever, you know, you had this like this four year career essentially where it was okay to do whatever you wanted because you're in school and you're learning this and ever, it was accepted. So now you're 23, you go out into the world. Then you hit 25. Now you're in your mid twenties. 
you've kind of been in this world. And if you're not in like, let's say a set job, people are asking you about that. You're kind of like thinking, wow, I'm getting closer to 30 than I was 20. Like I'm on the back half. Then you turn 27. People are starting to ask you if you're getting married. Like if you're not in a significant relationship, if why haven't, how, why haven't you bought a house yet? Like what's going on with your life? Then you turn 29 and you're like right bumping up against 30. And everybody is, you know, everybody's like on you and that pressure kind of like ratchets ratchets itself up right mm -hmm. so i think like i'm not envious of people in their 20s it's a hard it's a hard thing but mm -hmm. the rest of the world will be hard on you you don't need to do it to yourself right like they're going to do the rest of the world is going to do it for you as long as you're doing something that is progressive that you're making progress that you're a positive contributor to the people around you nothing else really really matters because a decade from now, the whole world's going to be different anyways. So don't worry about what's going on. Can you imagine of starting your, your dream business in January, on January 1st? Imagine your like New Year's resolution this past year. I'm going to start my dream business <laughs> January 1st. Here we go. We need about 60 days in and a world health pandemic is going to completely shut you down. So try not to try not to be so hard, you know, be, have that such as a, such a hard thing in your world because you don't know what's coming down the line. All you can focus on is doing your best and making progress and, and, and nothing else really matters. And then one day it'll click. Hmm. If you stay consistent with that, one day it'll click and then you're off to it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a fantastic uh, response to that question, Aaron. And I think a level of self-awareness needs to be learned by people, especially uh, in their 20s, who are in that stage where there's lots of pressure from parents, family, society, uh, even uh, social media, right? Where there's all of that pressure to, to find your purpose or to all of a sudden find the answer. And you should be like, well, I don't know, like, I want to live my life on a day to day basis and just kind of see how things evolve and just having that patience, I, I think is a really key part of success. Now, Aaron, uh, of course, part of your role as a vice president at College Bro is you coach and uh, you mentor uh, you know, franchise owners and young entrepreneurs. What yep. would you say has been um, some of the, the traits or perhaps approaches or what, what have you seen as a common denominator among some of your franchise owners who have been successful uh, from a young age? What have they done differently that perhaps maybe their peers are not doing or you would recommend a young entrepreneur to do to be successful based on your I think, experience? I think there's like the grit factor. So when I say that, like it's the ability to do the unsexy. It's the ability to do the things that are not, you know, that are, are not the things that you necessarily always want to do. And that discipline and the grit matters. And then I think there's like this little bit of like called life endurance that happens as a result of that, right? Like I think there's this weird, uh, so the, the, there's a, a weirdness that happens where somebody has more patience. Like naturally, I think people are more patient, right? Like I'm sure if you think about, whatever your immediate friend group you've got some people that are like the most patient people in the world and there's other people that are a little bit squirrely and the patient people that have the ability to put in consistent levels of energy and effort those are the ones that typically do better and it's typically in pursuit of a specific meaningful goal within their business so if you can clearly tie your behavior and your actions right now to a level of progress that gets you to somewhere that is meaningful, you'll typically continue to put those actions in. A lot of our, our student uh, franchisees are student entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs that we kind of teach that with. Uh, one of the biggest ways they get new customers is knocking on doors. That sucks, right? Like, I mean, I did it. I mean, I have no idea how many doors I knocked on. There's a lot of things you learn in there, but like, if it is about knocking on doors, somebody's going to stop. If it is about knocking on doors, which means I'm going, if I do this, if I do this for the period of time that I've said that I need to, it gets me to this stage. And if this next stage is in line with getting myself to whatever it is like on, on, along that path, that knocking on doors is no longer about knocking on doors. It's about the outcome that somebody wants down the road. And there still needs to be a grit factor. There still needs to be an endurance factor. There still needs to be, um, you know, again, like that, that patient side of things, but the goal like that usually matters too. And it doesn't need to be some like, 
crazy life altering goal. But I think the, the people that tend to be operating at that level of success are like endurance athletes. So that again, and I say that very, very like, uh, direct when I say that, like some of our most successful student entrepreneurs are student athletes in endurance sports. It's, they know how to do stuff like it's like, like that, right. For long, like unpleasant, uncomfortable things for long periods of time. Mm. That's somebody who's going to be super successful. Right. Right. Like, and that doesn't sound like, I don't know if I'd sign up for that. Right. Like <laughs> someone's like, Hey, if you can, as long as you can like do unpleasant, uncomfortable things for long periods of time, you'll be good. Right. I don't know if that's for me, but that's, that, that's how I would describe it. That, that's, that's kind of that X factor that, mm -hmm. that a lot of people have that are successful. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with you. When I reflect on my own personal entrepreneurship journey as well, my very first business, you're right, we got our leads by going out to knock on doors. And I remember I was very new to Canada at that point, and I was like my second, third year uh, being in the country, and uh, I had to go out in minus 40 degrees weather and knock on doors. But I knew that for me to pay my tuition, I knew for me to have enough work for my employees in the summer, for me to hit whatever goal I wanted to hit. I had to go knock on those doors. And that was just part of the process. It was not something to hate. It wasn't something to love. It was just something to do to hit my goal. And I think you're right. You know, you have to be able to take literally the shit uh, to be able to really get to any uh, any place uh, of importance. Even like all the all the stars we adore, whether it's the movie stars or, you know, the sports stars, you know, they're out there training every day. They're out there running every morning. And it's just part of the process to get to whatever goal it is. So I think people have to just not shy away from uh, the, the ugly part of, of the journey. And it's just part of the reality to be successful. Yeah, it was. it's interesting. I um. Something we work with uses an analogy periodically that I think is funny is like there's a um, a difference from you know being an entrepreneur. It's like our, you know, on the breakfast plate, um, you, know, you get eggs and bacon. Are you the chicken or are you the pig? And it, the entrepreneur is the pig, right? Like you're all in. Mm -hmm. and you got to be able to like deal with like you'd said the 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 shit that gets you to that point. And, and if you can't it's probably better to be a chicken and that's totally okay. Right. That's in that example. Yeah. Well, uh, great conversation. I, I want us to make it a little bit of a pivot in our chat here. I know that fishing is something that is very, very <laughs> important to you. It's a huge passion of yours. Uh, before I actually start asking questions about, you know, your, your fishing uh, business, what actually started this uh, fishing passion for yourself? Is this something you've always had from when you were young or something you developed later in your life? Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I probably fish right now in the last... 36 months less than I have in a long time. Mm. Uh, it's snowing outside right now. My, my boat is, I left the cover off, which was quite silly. It's going to be very mad at me, but um, you know, it's just a chapter of my life. I think it's what we talked about, even just, just on the conversation there. Like it can't, it's, it's got to sit to the side, right? It actually being on the water. But I, I mean, I, I love being outdoors. I'd live outdoors if I could. Um, you know, for me growing up, I mean, some of my first memories are on a river with my dad and, you know, my, I'm, I now as a, as a, <laughs> as somebody who's two small kids, like I kind of get it. Like it was a way for my dad to get the kids out of the house. So my mom could have like a morning to herself <laughs> a couple hours. And it just kind of started this, this passion. It was a thing. I love puzzles. I love figuring things out. And to me, fishing is just a puzzle The pieces change every day you know, rivers or lakes or weather or different species or all these different things. I just, I, I love being outside and I love trying to put the puzzle together and it's, it's fun to put it, it's fun to put it together. So I, I, I love it and I'm, I'm silly competitive. So when I was about 12, I learned about fishing tournaments and that they existed. And I remember fishing this first, the first tournament I ever fished was a, a tournament for perch, which are these little small fish. And um, I naive, I thought we were gonna like, I didn't think I was necessarily gonna just go out and win, right? But I'm like, ah, we'll be we'll be competitive. I'm like, gosh, do we ever like get our butts kicked? I mean, like, I don't know, bottom 10%. And that, that was like, from there it was on. And I was like, I gotta figure this out. And so that, that like enjoyment of being in the outdoors and loving the, you know, loving the puzzle, if you will, uh, multiplied by a competitive element was like it just game over for right. me 
<laughs> so you know it's not much different college we talk about college well the first my first year as a as a uh, as a franchisee i thought i was gonna be rookie of the year right like i'm gonna work this thing i'm competitive whatever i my butt kick like i mean i was profitable i guess but like yeah i was like in the bottom third and then like that's the best thing that ever happened to me because it fueled it for me right there was definitely this like instant learning gap and com- fueled by some competitiveness but yeah fishing for me gosh i can't get enough of it it's what i think of um uh, it's what I think of when I'm driving. It's what I think of in the shower. It's what I think of, you know, late at night, uh, laying in bed. I, it's, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I, I, I've never thought about fishing from that perspective, but you know, I quite understand because again, in my first year of, uh, of running a business, I thought I was going to, you know, do the best job ever. And I, I barely broke even. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was sort of a motivation to almost prove to myself that I can actually do this and I can be successful at this. And I think yeah. you know, just as humans, a lot of our endeavors or things we end up doing are things where we ch- almost challenge ourselves. And, um, and that's almost part of the reward in itself, challenging yourself to improve, to grow at a certain scale and persevering in it. But uh, at what point, Aaron, at what point did that became a business idea? So you were clearly passionate about it. You wanted to be good at it. You, and this was something that you've had great memories with. But at what point did that flip in your head switch to, I can make money at this? And how did that happen? Um, you know what? It, it, uh, it really... So Wu Tungsten's about four years old, but I, you know, I, I mentioned like when I was in high school, like I was guiding, like I was trying to make some money guiding. And then my professional life brought me to the U S and moved to Boston. And I was just, I got super disconnected to, uh, from it. Cause I was kind of pulled out of my network for a few years and then came back and I just, I knew I could kind of foresee the future. I felt like a little bit with, you know, work and, and career and, kids probably coming that I just wasn't going to be able to be on the water as much, but I wanted to be in the business more in, in the industry more. And that's where it was to me. I was like, if I can't be on the field, if you will, one of the ways for me to be um, just in it is to run a small business and, and to run a business. And I thought for me, there's a, a couple of things that were going on in the industry. And, and one of the things, the things that I like to do is I fish for largemouth bass, which live in a bunch of weeds and you use a weight that moves your, your bait through those weeds. And they're typically made out of lead and they started being made out of tungsten and uh, is such a superior product because it's in a smaller, it's a small, it's a more dense metal. So you can get a, a much higher amount of weight in a smaller package, which when you're trying to get something through something, it's, a benefit and it's there's a few other things to it but with that said I was like you know what I think I think I could sell that it felt like the market aligned and I was like well you know what like uh we took a small risk if you will um and started a small business but we started trying to build an Instagram community first and then it became this thing where I was like you know what like this is how I'm going to be able to snowing outside like again like right now where I am, I'm not on the water for at least another six months maybe I'll get one more day this year right but you know like six months and and then you know I was probably I knew like I didn't realize it was gonna be like this but I probably put my boat in the water four or five times a summer uh with COVID and managing a business and like kids and just stuff so but I was in the industry more this summer than I probably ever have been with the people I talk to on a daily basis uh, and, and what I'm doing. So, you know, when did I think it could become financial? Like, I guess I've always thought like, it's those things, right? I never, I actually never thought I wouldn't make money in the fishing world. I never thought that was going to be the case. I just realized, I think that I'm never going to compete at the equivalent of the NHL, NHL level. I'm never going to be able to, with everything, my other priorities, I'm never going to be able to have the time that it would take to invest to play at the highest level on the water. But I've got this kind of skill set on the other side that's going to allow me to play at the highest level off the water. And I think of it as a decade, right? Like we were just talking about. So, um, you know, I was talking to a friend there. Someone invited me to get go out on the water last two weeks ago. Uh, and I was like, I just can't, right? I just, it was a Saturday and I just can't. It was like beautiful. It was like 22 degrees. It was unbelievable here. Unbelievable fall weather. I'm like, I can't, I just had stuff going on. I'm like, yeah, when are you going to be able to get back on the wall? Like get on the water. And I wrote back 2026 and they were like, ha ha ha. And I'm like, I'm serious. Like, that's when I actually think based on things that are going, I'm like, that's when I think I'll get back on the water. 
um, more. And they were like, what's so long? I'm like, well, I don't know. It's like a decade since we would have started, you know, Wu Tungsten would be a decade old at that point. So I guess it kind of makes sense. Then I didn't even think of that when, until I, we were typing it back and forth. I'm like, man, that's so long. And I'm like, it actually feels kind of short to me. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, so I don't know. I, I, it never, so about four years ago, to the, uh, about a week ago, that business turned four years old. Our site went live. But it's always been in the back. Like, I don't say the back of my mind, but like just, uh, it's one of those like unspoken truths, if you will. Like I will make money and I will be in the industry. I will make like, that's where it'll be for me for the rest of my life. At some point, <laughs> it just happened to manifest itself in the short term as a business called Wu Tungsten. Right. I think it's something magical about, you know, having a passion and making money off of that passion. I think yeah. it's just, just magical. But one of the things you really mentioned that caught my attention, uh, Aaron, was you, you talked about creating a community. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like that was a huge piece of success behind the business. A lot of entrepreneurs think, I'm just going to create a product. I'm just going to focus on the product and everyone will come to me. But in this day and age, I don't believe that's going to cut it. Can you kind of just walk me through the place of creating a community and how that will successfully impact whatever business you have? Yeah, it's no different in College Pro. Like College Pro, we call it the, the CP fam. Like that's a community. Without a doubt, that's a community. I think, I mean, it's a non-negotiable that your product can't suck, right? Like that's just non-negotiable. Your product can't suck. Um, and it's not going to be the thing that's going to be a breakout unless you're like an inventor. Unless you are, uh, you know, in, in the Elon Musk Richard Branson, like if you're in that conversation, maybe your product can do something that'll do, you know, that'll take you to another level. But even there, I'd argue that like Tesla has got its own following, its own community, its own thing. It's just whether or not like you create channels to allow that community to connect. And I think for me, like that, that's a big piece. Like it's the connectivity. It's allowing other people that are kind of cut from the same cloth to have an, an arena or an environment where they're allowed to belong, which is community. And then fueling that by allowing there to be a, con- a connectivity between those, those people and giving them an outlet to be a part of that and showcase that where they wouldn't be able to have that somewhere else. So I think of college, bro, young entrepreneurs, like, gosh, like, I mean, I can only imagine you when you were trying to tell your friends about a long day on a ladder that no one else knew what the heck you were talking about. And I bet a lot of them, when you went, you were just talking about going to cold call in, in minus 40, I heard it in your voice. There's a little bit of pride in that, but your friends think you're nuts. Sure. <laughs> Me, I'm like, I re- I'm like, yeah, you did. Good for you. I mean, if we look, if you watch this back, you're probably, if we watch the two of our faces, you got probably a little bit of pride and I'm probably smiling and nodding that's a community. So it's like being able to have those things where there's like the, the understanding it, it, it has to happen to a level of or, organic level, which is I think an overused word, mm. but to me, organic means like, it's not manufactured. It's mm. there, right? Like you have you like this, like this conversation is, is organic, but we're, it is being facilitated by zoom and by all the podcast stuff and all these other things. So there's got, there's a, there's a facilitation around infrastructure that can connect the community, which will be what makes it bigger. And then there's the aligning what this thing is to the community, right? Like I think, so there's, there's that kind of piece of it. And when you do that and then infuse the product at that point, doesn't matter. I mean, again, it can't suck because the product sucks. The community that you've built will completely actually like reject it and probably kick you out of it. And that community is still gonna live over here. You're just not allowed to be part of it anymore. So there's like a genuineness, there's gotta be a product that matters, but um, you know, that matters and that, again, all those things fulfill some sort of a need, but like we sell little bits of metal and it's the most ridiculous community that I've almost, almost ever been a part of. You think about college, bro, we clean windows, <laughs> right? Like. We pull crap out of people's gutters, mm-hmm. right? Like we work long days in the sun all summer. And then after that, we go knock on doors. All those things are pretty, I don't know, low level. Is that the right word to say? I don't know. 
Most well, basic in their way. Passion. We have we have shirts that people say, "Dear Windows, I love you," <laughs> right? And it's a joke, but that means something to our community. Or I think mm. of the shirt that I wear: "Clean is greater than dirty," and I love wearing that shirt because I, you know, but so, but the community recognizes that. So you know, again, I think that's what Wu Tungsten has become. Wu Tungsten's mm. access to be able to be featured on Instagram stuff, you know, in, in Instagram stories from a big account. We DM everybody back. We have a text line that I literally so Black Friday's next week. We'll send our Black Friday stuff out through text message. I will sit there for four hours and write back to 1,200 text responses or whatever ends up happening over that period of time. Um, you know, I've got a partner that that is just as in it as, as I am that we do a lot of that stuff. So, you know, again, when I think about our infrastructure, we write back to every DM. Mm. And there's a lot of really, uh, I don't know, brutal DMs. That, that we get, we write back to all of them. You know, mm -hmm. we write back to every email, we write back to every text message. It's that connectivity mm -hmm. right to that community, feeling somebody feeling like they can get something reciprocated in that community and then putting them on a bit of a, a showcase where they won't anywhere else. Their that's friends nice. don't, aren't, 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 when they catch a giant smallmouth, their friends are kind of like, that's a nice fish. And they're like, this is a giant. And we're, but we're like, oh my God, that's a giant right like that's that's what a community is absolutely you understand better and you you're in the, in the arena with them and you can understand their feelings and yeah. uh, i think when i think of some of the most pop popular companies today or platforms the instagrams of the world twitters and the TikTok, i think the communities it empowers people almost in no way and i think that's the beauty of a community um, but I don't know, I want us to make a little bit of a pivot here. And now, one of the things that I know is important to me and perhaps to yourself is uh, the role of emotional intelligence and soft skills in yep. career success. Can you just uh, walk me through what you would say is uh, what, what has played a role in your success or the success of your people when just looking at it from the angle of soft skills and emotional intelligence? Um, I think, I mean, I think that is the difference between somebody who, you know, we're just talking about community, but like somebody who, who can be a great business owner and somebody who can grow in a, in a large organization is EI and soft skills. And uh, I do think there's a lot of things that can be learned. And then I do think there's a lot of things that are natural. So I think for me, emotional intelligence is, there's a lot to it, but if I were to simplify one of the biggest elements to me is the true ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's empathy, not sympathy, mm. but empathy, like that you can truly do that. And you make some decisions that don't um, necessarily hurt the organization or yourself, but create opportunities to uh, provide an environment that is the best fit for that individual person, which is really hard to do as the business gets bigger because there's lots of people. Mm. So when I think about soft skills, um, yeah, like that, that's where it is. It's, it's the, it's that, I mean, there's a lot of soft skills, right? Like I think there's like tenacity, I'd put that in a soft skill, mm. right? The ability to like push through something and see it through to the end. You talk about grit, like that's a soft skill. Leadership is to me like a, it's a, that's a skill with a whole bunch of different variables and ingredients within it. I think some people talk about leadership as leadership, but there's a lot of other things there. And then, yeah, emotional intelligence is like actually being able to, to, to understand what that person might value or be going through or thinking about and why mm. without judgment and understanding that and then being able to operate and act in a, in an appropriate way based on some of those things. And I think that to me, again, that that's, somebody's got to have that to be able to build a big, build a big organization because that's what will have people stay. Mm. And a big organization requires a lot of people. So, we're, you know, take tech, take everything we're doing like that, that is going to fuel things, but end of the day, it's still going to come down to human beings being human beings. Right. And through COVID, I honestly think that the businesses that like disappeared, a lot of them or were really hurt probably got exposed on EI, mm. right? When you think about, I mean, you and I aren't sitting together in person. There's no water cool. Like a lot of that stuff when it was, was, it was easy at that mm. point. Now there's like more kind of more to it. So I don't know if that answers that for, for you in general, but like to me, 
like soft skills and EI are, that's, I mean, that's the glue of a large organization. You can be an owner operator without it. No problem. Um, no problem. But if you want to build something that's like repeat referral sticks with you foundational, et cetera, you got to have it and it can be learned, but there is a, uh, yeah, there is a, um, uh, an element to that, that, uh, that's natural. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that if you want to scale your business in any way or scale your career, even whether you want to gain a promotion and be a leader on your team or whether you want to grow your business to have more employees or more revenue, you need people to scale in any, any version and having emotional intelligence skills is key to that. But again, Aaron, for, for the sake of some of our listeners who are thinking, well, I like this whole idea of EI. It sounds like something pretty cool to have, it's, but it's so abstract, it's so big. What can I actually do like right now to start building on those skills? How, what would you say from your own personal journey and your own experience? One, two or three things, actionable items or to do that you've actually done to help improve your soft skills, any area of your soft skills. I, I think like, so College Pro has been incredible it, for me in that it's put me in contact with a lot of different people. So I think the like you can't uh, have as high of a level of empathy for other people if you if you haven't uh, had the ability to experience that so put yourself in uncomfortable positions in different circles it's that's to me i mean i don't know that there's necessarily another way you can read about it for sure you can reflect on certain things like you can think about your own self you can do a bunch of different things but like get out there right like learn about other people learn about other cultures learn about people with different sexual orientations, learn about all these different things that are, are things that are completely not like you. And the only way you can learn about them is not by like reading about it, but like being in it. Hmm. And that's, you know, I mean, that's not an easy place to be. And it's, it's easier said for sure than, than done. But, you know, I, I think about understanding different people's like cultures and where their beliefs are coming from and where their actions are coming from. That will help you, somebody like, truly be able to like understand and internalize what's going on with other people. And I think about, you know, the first time I ever coached franchisees that um, were in Ramadan, that was weird to me. And when I say weird, like not weird, but like weird, meaning not like me. So like, I had to like think that through, right. Or like, I remember people like washing their hands and feet before we had lunch and like, having to be like, whoa, like, okay, cool. Like I got to think this, this through, right. Like about how this is that allowed me to have more uh, ability to understand and connect with other people hmm. right? thinking about like some of those things and, and understanding that it's part of their culture and part of their religion and all these different pieces. So, you know, I think like if someone wants to work on those skills, you gotta, you gotta actually go experience things. Like you can read about swimming, but you're not, you can't, like you can't actually swim until you get in a pool. Right. So go read about it for sure. Understand about it. Have an idea of what it is, but then go, go expose yourself. Right. To things truly. And you'll, you'll have a significantly fast track line on EI. Yeah. Absolutely. There is no best way to learn anything than by just being in there, putting yourself in that situation. And that forces you uh, to adapt, to learn, to grow. Now, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation here, but I do have one last question for you, Aaron, and it relates to the fact that we're in a pandemic and the pandemic has affected everybody <laughs> in one way or the other. What would you say has been, how how would you say you've thrived or you've you know, adapted in this pandemic? And what would your advice be to people who are perhaps struggling? Uh, what would be one, two or three things you would advise to, for people who are struggling through this pandemic? Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is like, just keep swimming. What are you going to do? Right? Like, what's the alternative? Really? Right? Like, I totally understand that there's different people in different areas and, and affected in different ways. But you're a good example. Right? Like, you adapted. Just keep swimming. What's the alternative? Keep going. There's going to be a 2021. I, you know, the thing that kills me is when people are like, I just can't wait till the end of 2020. Well, like New Year's Day 2021, January 1st, 2021 is going to be no different. It actually might be worse, just so everybody knows, <laughs> right? Like it might be worse. I don't actually know. So keep swimming, keep, keep moving. Now that's, again, I know easier maybe said than done, but, but that's, that is the number one thing to me. Mm -hmm. Keep going. The next thing is uh, to me has been um, being uh, 
option generating constantly and working through it. Like, I, I mean, uh, some of the things that I'll never forget about it is every day watching the news for the update to see like what's happening and then what do I have to do about it? That was hard, right? Like that was tiring, mentally taxing to be like, okay, what's going on? We don't know what this is. Are we allowed, I mean, college pro, are we even gonna be able to be in people's houses or on people's properties and when, and when can we do trainings? And like, just mentioned, we knock on doors and aren't we allowed to do that? We had to make a decision to do like constantly, but like option generated, then what? They took our biggest way of generating new customers was shut down in the most important time of the year. Well, then what? Well, we got to get, we've been behind on Facebook or, you know, in digital marketing, then what? So it's like that option generation. So keep swimming, option generation. And the other, you know, I think for me is just to, to not, the emotion over the data, emo, this, this time has been real, very real. But I think there's been a lot more emotion that's driving, um, yeah, a lot more emotion that's driving people's behavior than true data, mm. right? And I think there's the fear and people act strange when you're scared. And that's, it's okay to be scared, but understanding that you're act, that people are, a lot of people are acting from a point of fear is, uh, you know, it is, a, is a, a real thing too. Some of the biggest businesses, and you're talking about entrepreneurship and, you know, in terms of people that you said, you may or may not be listening to this, like some of the biggest businesses start in these times. Not because they are like this, this crazy new weird idea, just because a lot of other people stop. So if you are running a marathon, which is what entrepreneurship is, like I'm thinking about this, I got 50 years left. Like I'm honest when I say I'm like, I got at least, I have at least 50 years left. I probably have like three more recessions. Gosh knows what's going on in the world. Like this is just an, another one. I'm trying to learn as much as I possibly can, survive it keep my family and everyone I know as healthy as I possibly can control what I can control. But overall, I'm just going to keep moving. And that everyone else that I'm running this marathon with not everyone, a lot of people have stopped. They've, they've seen this giant hill or this like rainstorm or something crazy that's happening in this 26 mile race. And we're on mile I'm like, we're on mile four in my in my world. I kept running. And by the time they all took shelter and like stopped and I got to the other side of that rainstorm, now I'm miles ahead of it. Of it. That's why big businesses get built in giant recessions, pandemics, because when the world gets better again, you're already ahead and you have momentum. Mm -hmm. So I, I, again, I think that I totally understand it's easier said than done. I know it's hard if, you lo if someone lost their job and their income or their parents or all these other things, but like, what's the alternative? Stop then what? Mm. Wait till January 1st because 2020 is finally over. I laugh at all this stuff when people are like, well, that's a weird, that's a snowstorm. Just chalk it up to 2020. It probably snowed at some point in 2019 too. Mm. Right. Like, and you know, so it's all, it's just the, the emotion around it that, um, that I think a lot of people feel that really dictates their behavior beyond data. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic uh, response uh, to that question. Yeah, I think if there's anything I took away from that, it's focus on what you can control. A lot of things around us we can control. We can control how many cases of pandemic, we can control what the restrictions are. We can control a million things, but what we can control is how we respond to things, our mindset, how we choose to approach our challenges and problems. I would choose to whether complain or not complain. And in the end, that's all we can control. And that's the power we have. And we have to take advantage of that. Without a doubt, man. Yeah. 100%. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, Aaron. Uh, so much learning, so much wisdom you've shared. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure.